Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Murray. That was an amazing kind of overview of what's happening in early stage melanoma. But no, therapy of melanoma is not just immunotherapy, not just targeted therapy. Our surgical colleagues are huge collaborators. And I think, you know, every patient has met at some point with a surgeon and knows how important surgery is in the world of melanoma. So we're going to transition now and talk a little about surgery for melanoma. And I have the honor of introducing Dr. Sonia. Sonia Cohen, who is from the Mass General Hospital as well, and um, works there in both the melanoma and sarcoma departments, um, did her training at Johns Hopkins, MIT, uh, surgical training at MGH, as well as at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And also, in addition to doing surgery for melanoma and sarcoma, also has research interests in the genetics behind uh, many of these cancers and developing new therapies for them. And so with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Cohen. Yeah, thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, excited to share kind of how we think about surgery with you um, and thankful for being invited. Um, I don't have any disclosures. Um, I wanted to start with why it's such an exciting time to be a surgeon taking care of patients with melanoma. I think um, historically, uh, you know, surgery was one of the only options we had for patients with all kinds of cancers, and often surgery wasn't successful. Um, and that's really because of the biology of the tumors we were taking care of. But now, you know, this is a time where I get to take care of patients, and use surgery as just one of the tools to really help improve outcomes uh, with the goal of getting our patients through all their treatment, minimizing the risks and getting the best outcomes we possibly can um, so that people have a, a long uh, life with good quality of life. And that's really our goal. So let me see if I can. How do I, Jay, do you want me to leave this bar? Or... Okay, all right, no problem. Um, so the way I think about these are a couple, I just want to outline a few things about how we think about using surgery for melanoma. So one of the questions is why we use surgery to treat melanoma. And really there are three things that we think about. One is local control. So whether that's the primary tumor on the skin or you know other parts of the body where it arises, or whether that's um, a metastatic uh, tumor, um, we want to use surgery to help control that tumor where it is. Um, to prevent it from coming back. And if someone's having symptoms, we can use surgery to help with that. Um, a big part of what I do actually is uh, contribute to the staging of our patients. So right now, with all the data that Dr. Moradian talked about, um, the most important thing I think I'm contributing to our patients is figuring out, you know, like you saw, 90% of patients come in with a tumor that, you know, is most likely not going to come back. But we're really trying to find those 10% of patients where, you know, we can use other tools to intervene and help improve outcomes. Um, and I'll talk a lot more about that. Um, and then thinking about pathologic response when we're using surgery in combination with these neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapies uh, that you just heard about, um, that's really somewhere where I can contribute by um, removing the tumor at some point during the treatment to help us understand how we should give our entire overview of the patient's uh, uh, treatment plan. So then um, I have to think about which surgery when, um, and most of my slides will be um, reviewing that, um, but thinking about why local excisions, the sentinel lymph node biopsy versus removing all the lymph nodes, the index node that we use uh, along with our adjuvant uh, therapies, metastectomy, which is when um, a patient might have disease that's pretty well under control, even though they might have metastases, and maybe there are one or two tumors that I can help by removing to um, make it so that uh, they have less burden of disease. Um, and finally, something I won't really talk about, but I did want to mention, we, we do have other options for patients that aren't responding to our standard treatments, such as perfusing um, a limb with chemotherapy to try and help with the response to treatment. And there is some active research going on on combining this kind of old technique with new treatments we have, such as immunotherapy, to see if we can improve outcomes. All right, and then finally, how do we, you know, a lot of what I'm going to show you today is the data that guides how I actually do the surgery. So, like, what margins do I, I use and how do I approach a local problem versus a systemic problem? So, I want to start with the history of the surgical management of melanoma. And with many cancers, historically, like in the 1800s, once we had anesthesia and surgery actually became a tool that we could use and get patients to survive. 
um, you know, with advances in treating infection and things like that. Um, surgery was very aggressive for diseases like melanoma because it was really the best tool that we had. Um, so in 1820, there's um, some papers from a physician called Norris who described tumors rising from pigmented lesions in two families. And that was kind of the first description in the literature of probably was melanoma. But what they noticed is that even after they would resect these tumors, there were really high rates of local recurrence, meaning either in the skin where the tumor was removed from or in the draining lymph node basin. Um, and this um, observation sort of helped shape how uh, we learned about melanoma going forward. So then in the 1900s, um, really the best tool we had was surgical management. Um, and, you know, we were doing huge surgeries, not me, I wasn't there then, but, um, you know, the field was doing huge surgeries for these tumors with five centimeter margins, you know, which is a very significant amount of tissue. Um, removing all the lymph nodes because of this observation that it tended to um, recur lo locally in the lymph node basins. And these were really morbid procedures um, and patients didn't do that well. And so I'm really excited that, you know, we're here, this era that we're treating patients in. It's really a modern era where all our, our data is based on surgical trials, multidisciplinary care, and we get much better outcomes. Um, so this is a different way of looking at the staging that Dr. Meridian showed you in the last scan, and this is really what I am using all the time to try and think about my patients. Um, are they coming in with a precursor to melanoma? Are they coming in with stage one uh, or two, di two disease? That's really 90% of our patients. Or are they coming in with more advanced disease, stage three or stage four, um, where then I'm going to try and use the surgery and possibly nodal evaluation to really help figure out exactly where our patients are on this chart. Um, this staging, this is the AJCC 8th edition. Um, it came from over 50,000 patients that we've been collecting data from as a field since 1998. And it's based on really histopathological data. So what Dr. Meridian showed you that the pathologists are looking at under the microscope you know, how thick the tumor is. Is it ulcerated? Um, and this is um, sort of what helps us to really understand based on what we know about a patient from looking at their tumor under the microscope, both in the skin and in the nodes, how do we kind of predict who is going to do well and who could use additional treatment to help them do well? And this is because, you know, as I think it will be a theme here, the tumor biology is really reflected in these factors. And that's really why we're using staging. We're trying to figure out, is this a tumor that has good biology, the patient's going to do well? Is this a tumor with more challenging biology and we need to, to throw more to look at it? Okay, so we kind of reviewed this, Dr. Meridian, um, just thinking about um, what, it, but what I wanted to show you were the layers of the skin, because I think that helps to understand why we do surgery the way we do. So the melanocytes, which are the cells that melanoma come from, are really in this bottom of the epidermis, which is the top thinnest layer of the skin. And then you have quite a thick dermis underlying that shown here. Um, and what you see is that as melanoma progresses, you, the, um, the depth as measured by the pathologist uh, shown here is really what is driving how we think about the um, stage of the tumor. And this is because when we look at that staging system that we have and think about patients across the stages, a thin tumor uh, really is a lower risk tumor, meaning here that the chance of this recurring is low. Um, but then as you move up to thicker and thicker tumors, that risk goes up. So most of the patients who come in come with stage one or two disease and the, the um, central part of their treatment is going to be surgery with a wide local excision. Um, we know from a lot of studies that the local recurrence for these thin, low-risk melanomas after wide local excision is pretty low. It's less than 6%, so often surgery is curative. Um, and so, the, that, again, the goal of that excision is to give us good disease control at the primary site. And what we are thinking about when we're evaluating patients and making our recommendations is how do we balance that disease control with the surgical morbidity? So we've got things like wound healing, whether we're going to need a skin graft to close the wound based on where it is on the body, and thinking about impaired function, such as, you know, tumor that arises in the nail, if we have to do an amputation to really get good margins on that tumor, how is that going to affect the patient's function? Do we have other tools we could use to try and um, prevent impairing that function? And then also poor cosmetic outcomes, because it is important, especially for melanomas on the face um, or other places, to, to make sure patients have good quality of life after their surgery. So these are some examples to show you um, how that comes into play. 
Um, here I'm showing you actually what was a melanoma in situ, so a precursor to melanoma, but a pretty big lesion on the patient's arm. And what's outlined here is in the dark solid line is a half centimeter margin. So what you can see is removing that uh, tumor on the patient's arm is going to make it very hard to close that defect that we create. So we have to think about other ways to close it with a skin graft or, or other methods. And then showing you here on the right is an example of a patient with melanoma on the back. There we have a lot more tissue to work with. Um, so here, um, you know, in the dotted line, we've outlined where the tumor is. The blue dye is a dye we use for sending lymph node vibes, which I'll talk about in the next slides. Um, the dark line is a margin we had to take in this case uh, because it was a deeper tumor, so we need a wider margin. I'll go into how we decide that. Um, but what you can see is by uh, changing the shape of the excision we make, we're able to take that um, pretty big defect and turn it into a straight line scar that's going to heal nicely and look better for the patient. So why do we use the margins we use? And this is all based on big studies and um, pretty good data that's actually still evolving. Um, so the first two studies uh, were basically comparing for thin melanomas. So melanomas are less than one millimeter thick on that Breslow depth that the pathologist measures. Um, you know, comparing, because historically people used five centimeter margins, then they were seeing that they could probably get away with less. But they're just wondering what's safe. How thin can we go and still achieve good uh, rates of making sure that the tumor doesn't come back locally? Um, so one trial was comparing two centimeter margins to five centimeter margins, those historical big margins for these thin tumors. And the other study was comparing uh, one centimeter versus three centimeter margins. And what we learned is that um, for one centimeter margins, the local recurrence rates were equivalent whether you did one centimeter margins or three millimeters, centimeter margins, I'm sorry. Um, and that for those thicker tumors up to two millimeters, two centimeter margins were safe when you compare them to five centimeters. So the conclusion for that trial was that, you know, we probably can use one centimeter for the thinnest tumors, and we probably can use two centimeters for tumors up to two millimeters thick. Um, and that really helped us move away from these huge uh, excisions that we were doing previously to that. So then the next sort of round of evaluations of studies where people looked at patients and the different margins they were taking surgically, surgically to see how patients did afterwards, we're looking at um, the tumors that were more than two millimeters thick, so the, more in that intermediate heading up to the thick range. Um, and here they were comparing two centimeters to four centimeters, and they showed that there was no difference in the rate of recurrence or how the patients did long term. And so that taught us that two centimeter margins were safe, even for melanomas greater than two millimeters thick. And so that sort of led to uh, these recommendations. I took these from the NCCN guidelines, which really guide a lot of what we do. Um, and it shows that depending on the tumor thickness, so whether it's a precursor to melanoma or Breslow depths going from less than one to greater than four millimeters, uh, we use this to help us decide which margins are safe in terms of local recurrence um, uh, to guide the margins we take for surgery. And uh, so, let's see if I guess I can't. Um, so I'll just tell you what it says below where you can't see, but you know, kind of where the action is happening right now for this is two, two semi margins is still um, can be pretty morbid, especially if we're talking about something on the face or someone's hand or foot, where it really changes the amount of surgery and the amount of recovery time it takes. Um, so there's some question, I think a lot of us believe that probably one centimeter margin, especially today where we have all these other tools to help us deal with tumors that have bad biology, might be safe. Um, and part of the reason is that the original trials that um, were comparing the one to three centimeter margins for these thicker tumors were really all done in an era before we had these uh, new medications. And actually, they didn't even allow for evaluation of sentinel lymph node in those trials. So those patients couldn't have any other treatment either than the wide local excision, which just isn't really up to our modern standards. Um, and what they found, if you look back at those studies, all the recurrences they have weren't locally where we remove the tumor. They're all in the node <laughs> systemically. And so I think a lot of us believe that probably if we get away with even less at that primary site, help our patients feel a lot better and use these other new tools we have to deal with tumors that spread. Um, and so right now, 
Um, what's going on is this trial, uh, which is called Melmart 2, um, and that's really comparing whether one centimeter margin is safe for these thicker tumors, but in the modern era. So it's allowing all our normal treatment. It's allowing us to look in the lymph nodes, allowing patients to get additional treatment. And But because the outcomes we're looking for are probably going to be subtle, it's going to take a lot of patients and a lot of time. So it's probably going to be, I think, the projected end date for this trial is not until 2029. So it's going to be a while before we really have the data to back up sort of how we think the field will advance. Okay, so moving on to lymph node surgery, I wanted to talk about why we um, think about lymph nodes, and Dr. Moran introduced this in her talk as well. But if you look at that um, schematic of the skin and where the tumor starts, where the melanocytes are, and then the dermis and the subcutaneous uh, fat underneath, what you can see is that the lymphatics actually extend into the dermis. And so when you think about a melanoma that is growing in that epidermis and getting deeper, and it starts to encounter these lymphatic channels that drain all the interstitial fluid, all the fluid that your tissues make into your uh, lymphovascular system. And what's happening there is that's where your immune system is really filtering all that fluid and looking to surveilling for cancer. And this is just a schematic showing you where all the lymph nodes are in your body. So, you know, you have the, the local lymphatics in the dermis, and then that's all being drained to different stations where you have uh, concentrations of lymph nodes that are doing this immune surveillance. So historically for nodal surgery, like I said, it's been recognized for a long time that melanoma tends to go to the lymph nodes. That's different than some other cancers. It tends to go to the lungs, and that that's because it spreads through the blood rather than the lymphatics primarily. Um, and at that time, because of this observation, surgeons were just going in any patient with melanoma, they would just take all the lymph nodes out in the basin. Um, so if you had a melanoma on your arm, they would, you know, preemptively remove all the lymph nodes in your armpit. And what um, the problem with that is that it's very morbid procedure. You're basically, you know, a 50-50 chance you're going to get infection from that. And up to 30% of patients will have long-term lymphedema, which can be, it's a swelling in the limb um, that really can be debilitating over time. Um, so people were interested in improving outcomes for patients. Um, and Dr. Balk, um, you know, uh, probably like in the 90s, early 2000s, demonstrated that really when you looked at the specimens, when people removed all the lymph nodes for a patient with melanoma, let's say from the armpit, um, and looked and saw how many of the lymph nodes that they were actually removing actually had melanoma in them, it was only 20%. So 80% of the lymph nodes removed, um, in, even in a patient who had metastases to lymph nodes, didn't only had 20% of those lymph nodes with disease. Um, and so, so they were thinking, is it possible that we could only we could remove just the lymph nodes that had tumor in them and leave the other lymph nodes and hopefully improve outcomes for the patient? And that was really the motivation um, for something called the Sentinel Lymph Node Biopsy that was developed by Don Morton and his client and his colleagues. And they were really interested in just removing the lymph nodes that we had to remove. And that led to a lot of basic research looking into how um, the lymphatic system drain the skin, and could we actually trace the lymph nodes that drain a particular part of the skin to remove the appropriate? And so, this is a schematic showing the central lymph node biopsy, which is what they came up for, and have shown um, with a lot of great data across a lot of diseases that this works. Um, so, what I'm showing here is a you know, if you imagine a melanoma on a patient's abdomen that skin drains to lymphatics that end up concentrated in lymph nodes uh, either in the groin or in the armpit can actually cross to the other side. So it becomes really important because it's not uh, necessarily stereotyped to actually mark and trace where those lymph nodes are that drain that skin so that then you can go and pick out exactly the lymph nodes you want to test to see if there's melanoma there and remove them. And this is, so that's a very nice picture showing ideally how it looked. This is actually the kind of information we get. Uh, this is showing a patient um, where they, you can see this big blob of injection. It's um, a radioactive nucleotide that they're injecting into the skin. And then it gets taken up by lymphatics, mimicking the same way a cancer cell would travel if it was going to travel. And it shows which lymph nodes it's concentrated in. Um, but we have a little probe that we use in the operating room, and that helps us really uh, figure out which lymph nodes in which basin we need to remove. And then it, um, historically, we used to use that blue dye that I showed you before, but that 
Uh, we don't use that as often anymore. We might use it in tricky, in tricky cases. Okay, so then we started to move into an era where, okay, we know we can use this tool, the send the lymph node biopsy to identify which lymph nodes uh, drain the skin and might have cancer in them and remove those preferentially. Um, and initially the way this was used was that you would do the send the lymph node biopsy and then you would immediately remove all the lymph nodes that were in um, that basin if the patient showed any evidence of metastatic melanoma in them. And so initially when this was being developed, the question was, is, is it safe? Can we do this? Does it actually help? Um, and this uh, trial, uh, that MSLT1 trial, um, this was really looking at, you know, you have you did your wide excision, and then you could either watch the patient or you could do this lymph node surgery, the central lymph node biopsy, and then the complete lymph node dissection. Did this help? Um, and so most patients we learned had a negative central lymph node biopsy, and that's because you know most patients just have disease limited, the stage one disease limited to the skin. Even in patients who had a positive central lymph node biopsy, again, only 80% of patients had other lymph nodes when you remove the rest of the lymph nodes that had melanoma. So for 20% of the patients, it was potentially useful to remove that whole basin. But for 80%, we were probably doing too much surgery and just removing the central nodes was enough. Um, and importantly, what we learned is that doing the central lymph node biopsy followed by the complete dissection didn't necessarily improve survival. Um, but it did give us a lot more information about that patient and what their risk was of the melanoma coming back. So that was kind of our first clue that doing the surgery didn't necessarily change the outcomes for the patients, but it did help us predict how that patient was going to do and help us treat them appropriately. So then the next phase of the trial, MSLT2, came up, and that um, was really designed to ask that question. So, does doing that big lymph node dissection in patients with a positive central lymph node biopsy improve outcome. Um, and the way this study was done is that you either got your central lymph node biopsy and then we watched you really carefully, or you got your central lymph node biopsy and you went ahead and got that big, bigger surgery to remove all lymph nodes. And what we learned from that study is that actually it didn't improve survival. So patients didn't necessarily survive longer by us doing this bigger morbid surgery. Um, it did reduce the rates of the tumor coming back in the lymph nodes, but that's kind of makes sense because we've removed lymph nodes. And what we learned was that, you know, it's probably safe to watch patients and wait for that 20% of patients to have more disease come back and then treat them then rather than preemptively giving everyone who the positive send lymph node the morbidity of the surgery. And here, again, it's blocked a little, but what I'm showing you is that, you know, this study again showed that if you do a complete lymph node dissection, up to 25% of patients in that study had clinically significant lymphedema that they had to live with for the rest of their lives. And, you know, 80% of the patients who got that didn't necessarily need it. Um, whereas if we just did the central lymph node biopsy, you know, the rates of lymphedema were much lower. Okay. And then the last point I want to make is all this data is even before we had effective therapies like Dr. Murray and Dr. Fox. So we were able to already say, you know, probably we should just be doing the lymph node biopsy and then watching patients, even before we had better ways to treat patients and improve their long-term outcomes. Um, and that brings up the last uh, kind of word I wanted to use, which is salvage. So oftentimes as a surgeon, what we're thinking about is, should I use my surgery now? Even though I know it might, you know, cause some long-term complications for my patient, or should I save it and just use it for those patients that I need to salvage if their disease comes back and then I can use surgery. Um, and I think so we've all sort of moved to this uh, approach where we really use uh, the nodal surgery for the central lymph node biopsy in patients that qualify for it based on how their primary tumor looks under the microscope. And then we save the bigger surgery for the patients where we don't have other options. Okay, so putting the data together, we recommend wide local excision for all individuals with local regional disease. I'm um, just here again is um, the margins we use based on the data I showed you, and we are trying to move towards uh, what we think are safer and smaller margins. 
again, it doesn't matter that much if a tumor is on someone's belly. Most of us have extra skin there that, you know, it's not a big deal. But for other areas like the face or the hands or the feet, it can, it can make a big difference in how a patient does and really affect their quality of life. We have to do a bit of research. And then the other part of this is what I'm really doing is a lot of surgery to help really give a good stage to my colleagues in medical oncology. So uh, once I've done all my surgery, I've looked at the primary tumor and removed it. I've looked at the lymph nodes. I'm able to say to my colleagues, this is a patient with a tumor that we know from our data probably needs more therapy. And I've passed them on to them. And then finally, we still do use our complete lymphadenectomy or some of our more morbid surgeries in some, in some Cases. So patients who had a nodal metastasis that come in and that's their first presenting system, symptom or during surveillance, it comes up, you know, we might offer them a complete you know, dissection either with or without uh, adjuvant therapy. Patients with the positive signal nodes who can't get further surveillance for some reason, you know, they don't live in a with accessibility to medical care, um, or for some reason they can't have additional treatment, but they really, uh, systemic treatment, but they really need it. Those are also patients we might offer additional surgery to. And then finally, uh, patients where we really do need to palliate some symptoms, if that's the best option for them, and we don't have uh, other less morbid ways to deal with that. We talked about a little bit um, surgery for melanoma in the context of metastatic disease. So uh, we will remove tumors to help uh, Dr. Meridian look at the response to the adjuvant treatment, figure out how to change their therapy going forward to try and get the best response. Sometimes patients might have disease that's responding overall to systemic therapy, but maybe one tumor that's not responding, so we can remove that um, to help uh, get rid of any tumor that might have evolved some way to evade the therapies that are working for the vascular disease. Um, and finally, as you'll hear later, we do have really exciting new cell-based therapies under development, and often the surgeon will help um, by harvesting the tumor to develop uh, that for our patient. And then finally, I just wanted to say thank you to all our patients who help us learn more about melanoma. A lot of the what we do as surgeons is actually collect the tumor, see the tumor in the operating room, think of um, hypotheses for why we think um, melanoma might be behaving the way it, it is, and collaborating with um, other groups, scientists, um, really the field at large to try and come up with, with new methods to treat melanoma. Thank you.